Well, you know, last week I, I taught a sermon on uh, preparing to live in perilous times. You know, as things get worse and worse in this, you know, in this world, which they are, the Bible says they're going to go darker and darker, but, the, but we, the righteous, will grow brighter and brighter. So you are just starting to shine more. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I would say that if you could see in the spirit realm, all you are is a bunch of glowing uh, beings. Your, your spirit is glowing. You might not see it on the outside, but we're supposed to let it come on the outside, right? The Bible says we are the light of the world. How do we let our light shine? By doing good, by, by, by spreading the gospel, by healing the sick, by casting out the devil. That's good works. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So that's a good thing to do is pray for people and get the devil off their back. Amen. Amen. You don't need the devil on your back. He don't need to be in your life in any way anyway. If you're having trouble with the devil, you don't understand yet. You, you have power over him. Remember, you were created to be like God. You were created to act like God. You, you have been given the God power. And does God have power over the devil? Amen. So guess what? You have power over the devil. Amen? He has no right in your life, no right in your family, no right in your pocketbook, none whatsoever. Don't give him opening anywhere. Amen? Just, just let him know. You know, what, you know, where you stand, that you are the one in authority. You have been given dominion in this earth, and he has to bow to you. Hallelujah. You don't bow to him. He bows to you. <clears throat> so today I want to talk about uh, uh, being willing and obedient. Because, you know, the, one of the scriptures I like is in Isaiah, Isaiah uh, chapter 1. It says, if you're willing and obedient, then you'll eat the good of the land. And see, I see a lot of people are not eating the good of the land, and it's there for us. So maybe this will help you this morning. Because, <clears throat> you know, there are many promises in God. God gives us many promises in the Word. He gives us promise to life, health, prosperity, love, joy, peace. All of these are the promises of God. And let's start, let's start today in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. When we're done today, you'll know for sure how to, how to uh, get all the promises of God working in your life. You'll know how to do it. You'll know how to submit yourself to God, that God will, will bring these things to fruition in your life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 20, it says, For all the promises of God, how many? All, oh, all the promises of God in him. You notice where they are? They're in him, in Christ. Our yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So all the promises are for those who are in him. You know, the world, you know, the world doesn't have access to what you have access to. By being a born-again Christian, you have access to all the promises of God. Because it says here, they're all in him. They're all in Him. And if you are in Him, then all these promises are for you. They're for true believers. They're for yes and amen. So then uh, my question is, why are there many sick in the body of Christ? Why are there people in the body of Christ that are broke and depressed and have no joy? So something's wrong. All the promises are there for us. So none of these things should be in our life. We should have no sickness in our life. We should have no poverty in our life. We should have no depression, oppression in our life. That stuff should be far from us. So the reason is we have not tapped into the promises of God. So today we're going to look at some things so that you'll know how to tap into the promises of God and you will know how to bring them into your life. So first of all, these, as I said earlier, these promises are for God's children. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus was, was uh, eating and a, a woman from a, a different nation came in asking him to heal his daughter. And Jesus said that healing is children's bread. That means it's for his people. Healing's for you. But through her great faith, she, she did a still appropriated healing for her daughter. 
But I, I thought it was very interesting when Jesus said that, that this healing is uh, children's bread. It's for you and I as children's of, children of God. So first of all, as children of God or those who are in him, I'll even put it a little bit farther, it's those who are disciples. See, the casual Christian doesn't get a lot from God. The casual Christian, you know, I, I, I can't say a lot because salvation is a lot. It's, it's the thing. But as far as living in this world, they don't know why things happen. You know, why did God do this? Why did God let, me, let this happen to me? God doesn't do that stuff. Say, God's a good God. Amen? Amen. God's a good God. A good God doesn't do bad things. There's no, no evilness in God. There's no badness. The Bible says that, uh, that there is no darkness or shadow of turning at all with God. God is good, and he's good all the time. Amen. So remember that. So let's go over to John chapter 15. And we're going to find out why are we not, maybe, maybe some of you haven't experienced all these blessings, or maybe there's areas you haven't yet tapped into. Well, today, after we're done, you will know how to tap into them. So you can live a life of health, you can live a life of, of wealth. You can live a life of peace and joy. How many, how many would like to live a life like that? Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, it's here for us. It's, it's in the treasure book of God. But you know, one thing I found out is you've got to dig for treasure. Amen? Amen? It doesn't just, it's not like, you know, I was out looking at an apple tree this morning and apples are underground. Apples just fall off the tree and you can go pick them up. You don't even have to climb up and get them. Well, it doesn't happen like that in the kingdom of God. Things don't just drop out of heaven. You know, what, what we need to get things from God is a very simple thing called faith. With faith, you can get anything from God because faith pleases God. Here in John chapter 15, verse number 7, this is what Jesus said. If, that's a big little word, if. So he's, he's putting it to us, saying, if you do this, you know, because a lot of things in God are, are um, <clears throat> you know, are contingent on us doing stuff. He said, if you abide in me, and then I'll put it this way, and if my words abide in you, then you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. In other words, you can ask for anything. Anything. That's what this is saying. You can ask for anything. But I, you know, I found out that you're not going to get everything because most people don't ask, don't ask in faith. See, if you don't ask in faith, you're not going to get it. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm a hoping and a praying. Well, keep on a hoping and hope that, I hope that hope turns to faith. Because as long as you're hoping and a praying, you're not accessing God yet. You've got to be saying, I'm a faith and in praying. I'm a faith and I believe. <laughs> We've got to change this around. So he says, if... You abide in, in me, well, as a born-again believer, we're in him, right? Amen. But here's the question, are you living in him, <coughs> or are you one step in the world and one step in him? Or maybe two steps in the world and one step in him. If you abide in me, abide means dwell, live, is God the focus of your life? If you want these promises, God's got to be number one. He can't be number two or number three or number five. He's got to be number one. If you abide in me, that's number one, the first thing. If you, if you want the, good, the promises of God, number one, you have to abide in God. Your life is living, is living uh, in, the promise, or in the things of God, in the word of God, doing what God tells us. Then the second part says, and if... My words abide in you. Is his word living in you? You know, it's like this. If, if, if something happens, if you stub your toe, do you scream and holler and curse? Or do you say, praise the Lord. By his stripes I'm healed. What comes out of your mouth? Listen, listen to yourself talk. Out of the abundance of your, of your heart, the Bible says, the mouth speaks. What is coming out of your mouth when something happens? Do you say, oh no, oh me, or praise the Lord? Where is your trust? If you, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. See, his word is living. 
Hebrews says the word of God is alive, it's living. It's in, it's in our being, it permeates our being. You know, it's like the song we were singing today. I remember uh, a minister many years ago, he told me about, we were praying about something and we prayed a prayer. And he says, amen, he says, that's it. He said, now all you gotta do, Tom, is say, it's working in there. The word is working in there. I don't have to feel it. I don't have to see it. I don't have to touch it. It's working in there. It's doing something in there. You know, I liken it to somebody of, you know, if somebody has a headache and they go take a, an aspirin. I'm probably dating myself because I don't know, does anybody take aspirin anymore? <laughs> There's ibuprofens and Tylenols and all this other stuff. The only thing I ever remember is Bayer aspirin. That's, a, that's, that's how long ago it's been since I took some. Hallelujah. But, you know, when you take something like that, you might have a headache and you take an aspirin or ibuprofen or Tylenol, and you swallow it down with a glass of water, and you don't go, ah, oh, it didn't work. No, you wait, because you know it's going to take a little while. It's got to go down, it's got to digest, it's got to get into your blood system, and then maybe half an hour, hour, whatever it takes, maybe the headache subsides. So it takes time. It takes time. It's the same with the Word of God. It takes some time. So when you say your prayer, it's done. It's done as far as God is concerned. But it just takes a little time to activate in our life. So he says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you. Your word, the word is living, uh, it, living in you. Then you will ask what you desire and it shall be done. It shall be. God is very positive here. You ask what your desire. What is it? What is your need? He didn't say what is your greed. What is your need? What is your need? And it will be done for you. So, <clears throat> if your life is abiding and the word is abiding, whatever you ask will be done. And as I said earlier, over in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter. Let's go over there. Isaiah chapter one, and look at this verse. In verse number 19. Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 19. If, oh, there's that little word again. There's that little word, if again. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you're willing and obedient. Two things are necessary. If you're willing, if you're willing, it's not only just doing the word, but doing it out of a willing heart. Not just doing it parroting somebody, not just, not just doing it out of obedience. Yes, we should do it out of obedience, but it has to do with our heart. You know, everything, everything that you, you connect with God is, it's connected to, in two things. First of all, it's in your heart, and then it's in your mouth. Romans chapter 10. The word of faith is in your heart. And then it's in your mouth. You have to believe it. And then speak it. Amen. Amen. Say that. Believe it. Believe it. And speak it. And speak. That's how you activate the word of God. You can't just speak it because somebody else speaks it. I mean it's good, good to say it. But for it to actually do something. It's got to come out of a heart of faith and a willing heart, a willing heart. <clears throat> this has to do with our attitude. We don't do it, do it grudgingly. Oh, I have to do it, God says I gotta pray. No, 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 we get to pray. Oh, it's Sunday, I gotta go to church. No, you don't gotta go anywhere. You know, you can live in misery if you want. <laughs> you get to go to church, amen? Amen. I found out going to church is something that keeps me from depressed, being depressed and oppressed. I like to go to church and praise God. Something about when you get in and you start worshiping God, praising God, a lot of that stuff just kind of goes away that's been following you around. So I learned about doing that a long time ago. You don't, you don't do things grudgingly or because... Uh, you, because you have to, you do it because you want to please the master. I want to please Jesus. 
I want to please Jesus. My heart has to be. If you, if you actually backed up, I, I was looking at this scripture, if you're willing and obedient, you eat, shall eat the good of the land. So every time you see a scripture like that, it's kind of good to go and see why did he say that. So I backed up and I went into verse 16. Listen to what he was telling uh, Israel. He said, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Put away evil from your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as white as wool. And then, after you do all them things, if you're willing and obedient to do these things, then you're going to eat the good of the land. If you're willing to clean up your life, clean up your, 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 your existence, then everything's there for you. You can't live like the world and expect the blessings of God to come in your life. It just doesn't happen. Because the world is, is in darkness and we're in light. The promises of God are in the light. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now Deuteronomy chapter 28 is a, is a, is a really uh, good book for you to look at because there's, there's a lot of things. It first starts out with the blessings of God of follow, for following God and then it goes on and says all the curses, the bad things that'll happen if you don't follow God. And God's not saying this, you better follow me or else I'm going to do this. No, it's God saying, follow me. This is the way. If you stay on this path, everything will be good for you. If you go your own way, then you're going to, you're going to go the way of the curse. But over in, ver in uh, 28, verse 45, he says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you have been destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and statutes which he has commanded you. And, and they shall be upon you as a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever. Why? Verse number 47. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. See, that's the heart part. You serve the Lord with joy. Be glad to do what God says to do. Now, he talks about all these curses come upon you because you did not obey or you did not walk the way God says. You know, you know it, it's, if you're driving down the road and, and uh, you know, and, and the Bible, or the Bible, the road, the sign says no passing zone, and you decide, oh, what the heck, I'm going to pass anyway, and a big 18-wheeler comes over the hill and smashes you, whose fault is that? It's your own. Your own, because you didn't obey, obey the signs. You know, it's not the government's fault. The government put a sign there. See, that's what God does. God puts signs out there. You know, don't go this way. It's not that God is a, is a God that says, don't do this, do this, all these laws. Them are just out there as to guide you through life. Do this, and then you will prosper. Give, and it'll be given to you. Just simple, simple things that God tells us to do. So this is, this is uh, here is speaking about the curse, which we're not under anyway. And in the New Testament, the Bible says we have been redeemed from the curse. But here's why things happen. You know, you can put yourself under the curse if you want. You can go live like the world and live in the, in the cursed world. <clears throat> but we are to serve God with joy and gladness of heart. You know, when I talk about the heart, that's your deepest inner, inner, inner being, that you're serving God. It's your attitude toward God. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. That's our choice. Our choice is to be willing and then obedient to do what God says to do. Go over to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Remember I said, I, when I preach sermons, I feel like I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a painter, I'm painting. And I give out scriptures, and what I'm doing is I'm putting a picture together. And hopefully when I'm all done, there's going to be this nice picture there. And when you leave this morning, you're going to say, oh, 
And I got it. So all these scriptures are tying all things together for us. So in Luke chapter 6, verse number 46, Jesus is speaking and says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Isn't that interesting? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? It's not just about saying, well, Jesus is my Lord, so I, I get all these things. It's not about that. Because he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Do the things that I say. He expects us to do things. For the blessing to flow in your life, we must be obedient. Do what God says to do. Do his will. You know, over in James, James says, faith without works is dead. dead. If you don't do something with your faith, you, you might say, well, I got all the faith in the world for healing. But if you're not walking in divine health, your faith is dead faith. It's just something you're talking about. You're not really doing it. If you're saying, well, I have all the faith in the world to, you know, I, under, I understand prosperity. But if you're, if, you're, if you're in debt up to your ears and you can't make ends meet, you don't understand prosperity. You know, you gotta, there's more to it. You know, don't settle for wherever you're at. You know, if you, if you think that this, wherever you are in life and you say, well, you know, this, this is where I'm at, I guess this is how I'm going to live, then you're going to live that way. I like to have a vision beyond that. I like to be like Abraham. Remember when Abraham and Lot in the Old Testament were about to separate and, and God spoke to Abraham and Abraham, he said, Abraham, get out here and look. He says, as far as you can see, I will give it to you. In other words, where is your vision? Where is your vision for life? Do you have higher goals than where you're at now? Because if you don't, you're never going to get there. You know, one of the things you should do, and you, you know, I, I usually talk about this at the beginning of the year, is you ought to set goals. Where do I want to be this time next year? Where do I want to be five years from now? Where do I want to be ten years from now? Because I tell you, I'll tell you what, most of you know this, these years go by pretty fast. Pretty fast. You know, things that I was believing God for 10 years ago, I wrote them down 10 years ago, I'm thinking, wow, that's a long way out there. Well, it's already been 10 years. Some, some of them have been 20 years. But you, if you don't have a vision, if you don't have something out there that you're shooting for, how do you know where you're going? You gotta have something out there to shoot at. You gotta have something out there. Uh, you gotta have a vision. <clears throat> so if things aren't working in your life, don't just go through the same thing every day, every day, every day. They call that a rut. Don't get in a rut. You know what? You know, if you're in a rut, what happens? You become depressed. Because you can't see beyond the rut. You're in the rut. You're on the side of the road. You can't see the highway. People are going by 100 miles an hour on the highway and you're in the rut. Don't stay in the rut. No matter what you're in, you got to see or you got to find a way out. Don't settle for mediocre. See, the Bible says you are a king. You are to reign in life as kings with Jesus. You are to reign. What does a king have? A king has anything he wants. The same way you should, you can have anything you want. We just read in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it will be done for you. Where is your vision? Where are you going? What is your plan for tomorrow? What is your plan for next week, next month, next year? The Bible tells us that you need to write it down and make it plain. You have to have something to shoot at. So don't settle for, don't settle for mediocre. You're a king. You're a priest. You're, 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 you're a child of God. My goodness, God has given us all these promises. I mean, I've, I've, I, got, I got visions way out there. Like they say, shoot for the stars. If you miss, at least you'll hit the moon, right? Hallelujah. So it's not just about saying Jesus is Lord, 
For the blessing to flow, we got to be obedient, do his will. Faith without works is dead. James says, don't be a hearer of the word only, but be a doer. Got to do it. You got to do it. <clears throat> Everything, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. So let me give you an, a practical example. You know, I don't want to just tell you about it. I want to tell you how to do it, right? Amen. I want you to know how to do it. Let's go over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. One of the things, um, one of the things I find is that I haven't met too many people that have too much. I think I find more people that have lack than too much. So if God promises to meet all of our needs, if God promises to give us whatever we want to take care of all, all of our, our needs, if, God, if it's God's promise, which it is, it says that God desires that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God, God desires for you to prosper. In the book of Psalms, he says God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his children, of his servants. So then we should prosper, right? But why don't we prosper? Why, is, why isn't it? Why, why can't you reach in your pocket anytime you want and pull out a $100 bill? I can. It's, it's, you know, because I learned how to prosper. I'm not saying that to be arrogant or anything. I'm just saying God blesses me. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God blesses me. So here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So the Bible tells us Jesus left his home in heaven. Now, if, uh, we were in, in our Bible study uh, Wednesday. We were looking at heaven. We were looking at how heaven was, was made with, with uh, gates of pearl, streets of solid gold. We had all the foundations were made out of these precious stones. So... Heaven lacks nothing. Heaven lacks nothing. So Jesus left that habitation to come here on this earth. He was, he was rich beyond anything that anybody could say, but he came to this earth to live like people. He gave, even though when Jesus was here, do you realize when Jesus was here on this earth, Jesus was not poor. A lot of people think Jesus was poor. You know, foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, that's because he was out somewhere where they didn't have a hotel. He had a house. In the Bible, Jesus threw parties in his house with hundreds of people were coming. That's a pretty big house. How many people can you fit in your house? Jesus had, had 70 uh, people, 70 people plus his disciples and their family who traveled with him that he took care of. So Jesus was not poor as far as human standards are concerned, but compared to what he had in heaven, he gave it all up to become poor. Everything Jesus did, he did, he did so that, you know, like he paid the price, he, he shed his blood for your sins to be cleansed. He was whipped and beaten by his stripes so you could be healed. Shame was put upon him so you, didn't, you, you could live a shameless life. No guilt. See, he took everything on the cross that we could live this life without any shame or without any guilt, without any sickness, without any disease, without any need. He paid it all. It's all paid for. And he became poor that we might become rich. So he wants you to be rich. He wants you to be rich. But again, I always say, let's put it in perspective. He doesn't want you to be rich so that you can, you know, blow it on all kinds of, of, of useless stuff. You got to be rich to help shed, spread the gospel, to help the poor. So Jesus makes it very simple. How do you fulfill this, this promise? Very simple. Luke 6.38. Give, and it shall be given. 
That, that is one of the easiest things to do. It's, well, it's one of the easiest commands, but it's, for people it's hard to do. So what, you know, remember, you, whatever you have, you're just a steward of it. You don't own it. You don't own the clothes you wear, you don't own the car you drive, or the house you live in, or, you, you don't own that. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God's allowing you to use it. So at any time, God could say, give your house to your neighbor. Give your car to that guy over there. And we would have to do what? Obey. Obey. Are you willing? Did you ever sit down and think about, am I willing to do that? Am I willing? If, if, if God tells me, am I willing to take my car keys and just give it to somebody? Am I willing to do that? That's my car, not my truck. <laughs> Am I willing? Yes, I'm willing. If God told me to give my truck, to, my truck or my car to some, I would do it. I mean, I have already given, yeah. given them away. God said, do it, do it. <laughs> I, was, I was out on a trip once with my wife years ago, and God told me to give all my money to somebody, and I did. So then we went out to eat, and she said, I said, I don't have any money. What'd you do with it? I gave it all away. But guess what? God blessed us exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. God will always bless. Giving is the way to get. If we could just get that in here. If you want to do it, if you want to do it the hard way and go out there and work your fingers to the bone, fine. You know, you work. The reason we work actually is to get seed to sow. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, you're going to reap whatever you sow. So to bring this promise into your life, I mean, there's a, I can give you probably 20, 30 more scriptures on it, but I just wanted to touch on, on, on this, that uh, this is the way to give. If you want to be rich, you've got to give. You have to give. You, you're going to do it two ways. You're going to work your fingers to the bone and work a job, work... 12, 16 hours a day, and, and then you have to have a, go, a job good enough where you're going to be getting paid hundreds of thousand dollars. You're never going to be rich. You'll never be. And really, what is, what is rich? What, what is having enough? To me, having enough is having all my bills paid, having enough to take care of myself, my family, and then having enough to give to somebody else. I'm rich. For every good work. I'm rich for every good work. I feel, uh, right now, I'm rich. I have all my needs are met, all my bills are paid, and I have money to give. I have, I have money to give, and that's what I love doing is giving. Amen. Because you can't outgive God, amen? amen? You know, I told you a couple of testimonies. Years ago, I gave my pastor, uh, I, I bought him a new suit. I seen he was wearing the same suit to, to church. Uh, you know, he, I think he might have had two suits, or else he had one suit and two pairs of pants. But... <laughs> But he always was in the same, same outfit. And so I, 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 I was working at the time and I had a good job. So I gave, him, I gave him a handful of money and told him to, you know, go up to Duluth to the men's store and buy yourself a couple of new suits and a couple of new pairs of shoes. And, and he did. And uh, what happened to me? I have a closet full of suits. I have so many suits I give them away. I've given them away, but they keep coming back. I, I feel, I, I feel sometimes almost ashamed. I have so many jackets in my house. My daughter was home one time visiting and she went in my closet and she said, Dad, what are all these jackets? I said, I don't, they just keep coming. I just keep getting them. So I give them away. I've been giving, you know, I just, I love doing it. But they keep coming back. So I can give some more. They keep coming back. So I can give some more. See, it's the same way. It does that with money. It does that with, with goods, whatever it has. It does that with love, with friendship. You give love, you're going to get love. Amen? Amen? You can't be an old grouch and expect people to love you. Amen? You can't be owly all the time and want, well, why does nobody come around me? You got to smile. Say, do nice things. 
<clears throat> if, you, uh, if you want answers to prayer. So that was, that was how to get prosperity. It's very simple. It's so simple, most people don't do it. I told my kids this when my kids were young. And anybody here, you're, you're, you're you know, 30 years old or so. I, I, I give you a, a, a guarantee you can retire as a multimillionaire. A guarantee you can do it. I know it now. I wish I had knew it back then, but I know it now. If you will save 10% of your income right now, by the time you're 60 years old, you'll be a multimillionaire. 10%. That's a good number because that's what God asks us to give. 10%. I'll guarantee you, you'll be a multimillionaire by the time you retire, by the time you're 60 years old. But you know what? A very small amount of people will do it. Because for some reason you think, I can't get along without that 10%. Well, you can. You take it away. Government takes more than 10% out of your check. You don't miss that. You might grumble about the government, but you don't miss it. You learn to live by it. Well, learn to live without that extra 10% and invest it, and you'd be surprised what will happen as the years go by. All right, how do I get prayers answered? You know, these are simple things. If you're willing and obedient, it's very simple. John 15, 7, we, told, we already went to there. If you abide in me and my word, words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you will. Now let's go over to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Everybody loves Psalm 91. <clears throat> Okay, here's how to get your prayers answered. All the time, every time. First of all, you gotta ask in faith, right? Remember? And without no doubting, you can't doubt. Don't even ask if you can't believe. Wait until you got faith. But then it says here in verse, Psalm 91, verse 14. Because he's, talking about you, has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, that's prayer, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. So how do we get this? By putting our love on Jesus. If you have set your love upon Jesus. Now, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. In other words, do what I, I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments now, that everybody right away, right away goes there. I'm talking about his commandments that he said. What does he say? Remember, I said, give, and it shall be given. Love. Love. If you love me, you'll keep my commandment. Believe. Believe. Jesus said, only believe, and all things are possible. Just simple, simple words he gives us. What did he tell Peter? Come. Come. And what did Peter do? A miraculous thing. He walked on the water from one word from God. You know, so just do these little things that Jesus says, and that'll show him that you love him. And if you love him, he said, I will set you on high. Remember I said, you don't have to live a mediocre life. We don't want to wallow in the mud like the world. We want to live the high life. Because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer. See, when you're walking in the ways of God, God will answer. Why? Because I'm willing and obedient. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Look at this one now in verse 16. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. How are you going to live a healthy life? How do you live a healthy life? Well, you know what the world says? Eat right, you gotta exercise. So in other words, you gotta, you gotta eat organic food, you gotta go to the gym three days a week, nah, nah, nah. The Bible says bodily exercise profits a little. So it's, it's okay, but godliness is profitable to all. Let's go look, how do we get healthy? Watch this, let's go over to Proverbs chapter three. Very simple, say pastor, Say this with me. Pastor. Pastor. You're speaking so simple today. You're speaking so simple today. <laughs> but the problem is, most people don't do it. 
Just like I said, most people won't take that money and put it in the bank. How much is in your bank account? If you want to talk to Dave Ramsey, you should have at least six months worth of bills in the bank, cash. At least, that's, a start, that's your beginning, your start. But how many people have that? I don't think there's a lot of people who have it. Be wise, be wise. Okay, Proverbs chapter three. Here's how you can enjoy a long and healthy life. Proverbs chapter three, verse number seven. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It, what it, the obedience to what he just said will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think I, I can do it myself. I, I don't need God. I can take care of it myself. I was thinking about, remember the, the, the king in the Bible, Herod? He thought he was something. He got up and gave a big speech and everybody said, he's like a god. And immediately the Bible says that worms ate him up. He brought a curse into his life by how he, by how he spoke. It says, do not be wise in your own eye. Fear God, or that means, that doesn't mean to be afraid of God, or reverence God. Depart from evil. Get away from darkness. Get away from things that are wrong. Because then it will be health to all your flesh. Flesh are, are healing and strength for our bones. You know, a lot of times, you know, it seems common in these days that people are getting uh, hips replaced and knees replaced and elbows replaced and, uh, and having trouble with their bones. Well, the Bible says here, if we fear God, depart from evil, our bones are going to be strong. The Bible says, in the book of Proverbs, it says, enviness is rottenness to your bones. If you start envying, you're, you're envying what other people have, you're, you're going to worry yourself and your bones are going to rot. We don't want that, amen? Amen. Okay, so now let's go over to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20. He says, My son, give attention to my words. Pay attention. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So if you look at them two passages, he's telling you, you got to stay in the Word. You got to stay in the Word. You got to read your Bible. You got to study your Bible. You got to confess the Word. This is what he's telling you here. If you do these things. Verse 22, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. If you want to be healthy, just partake of this. It's okay to take your vitamin B, vitamin C, vitamin E. It's okay to do that. But take your vitamin B, I, B, L, E. Amen? Amen. Take it all the time. It's, it says it right here. This word is health. It's life to those who find it and health to our, all of our flesh. You live by the word. You confess the word. This is life. This is real life. Not just existence. We don't want you to just exist. We want you to have life so you can jump up. Amen? You can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Amen. At my young age, I can still do that. Hallelujah. <clears throat> it's simple. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Doesn't that sound simple? I gave you very practical things to do to get healthy, to get wealthy, to get your prayers answered. Very simple thing. And if you do them, it'll happen. It'll work. Remember, don't just try it. Do it. Just make up your mind. So I want to lead you a little prayer this morning because I want you to, if you listen to me this morning, I want you maybe to make an adjustment in your life. Maybe you haven't really been willing. You've kind of been a little, you know, grudgingly following God or doing things. I want you to, I want you to choose to do it with gladness. Be willing. I want you to be make a decision that you will be obedient to God. If you want things to work good in your life, 
If you want to live like a king, if you want to be healthy, wealthy, you, got to, you just follow the word of God. It's there. It's all there for us. So why don't you stand with me for a second. All I'm going to do is lead you in a little prayer of commitment today, or we call it consecration. Where all we're going to do is let God know that we are willing. You know, if, if you pray this out of your heart, God knows. If you don't want to pray it, don't pray it. If you, if you want to be rebellious, be rebellious. If you don't want the blessings of God, then don't pray it, don't do it. You know, live, live your own life. If you, want to, if you want to, you know, like that song says, I did it my way. My, that don't work. Your way don't work. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we're just going to make a little adjustment in your life. Just pray with me. Say, Dear Lord, Dear Lord I come to you in Jesus' name today. I come to you in Jesus' name today. I choose to be a willing servant. I choose to be a willing servant. I choose to follow you. I choose to follow you. With joy and gladness in my heart. With joy and gladness in my heart. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for saving me. And paying the price. Paying the price. For all the promises. For all the promises. That are in your word. That are in your word. Lord. Lord. I will do my best. I will do my best. To be obedient to your will. To be obedient to your will. To follow your word. Follow your word. To do what you tell me to do. To do what you tell me to do. And then. And then. You promised. You promised. I will eat the good of the land. I will eat the good of the land. I will be healthy. I will be healthy. I will be prosperous. I will be prosperous. I will be full of joy. I will be full of joy. And full of peace. And full of peace. That's your promise. That's your promise. Lord, I'll keep my promise. Lord, I'll keep my promise. And I know you'll keep yours. And I know you'll keep yours. So I commit myself today. So I commit myself today. To this prayer. To this prayer. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I'll say amen. Amen. Now shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now you're in, in a place to receive the promises of God. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. And we want you all to be eating the good of the land. Amen. Amen. I don't, we, we don't want to eat. I mean, I love hamburgers, but I like steak better. Hallelujah. You know, and we want the good things once in a while. Amen. So all you out there in Facebook land, God bless you. And we'll be talking to you next week. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.